today. We want to welcome you today to Chattanooga Valley Baptist Church. We are so glad that you've come out this morning to worship our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, together on this, uh, on this Lord's Day. Uh, if you're a guest today, we want to uh, welcome you particularly. We would tell you, ask you to take the little side of your bulletin. It tears off, and you can uh, fill that out and drop it in the offering plate or give it to a staff member when you leave today. We'd love to have a record of your visit and have an opportunity to tell you more about who we are here at Chattanooga Valley Baptist Church. If you're not a guest, uh, there's a document on the end of all the pews that I wanted to uh, mention just a minute. We're in the process of migrating uh, over to a, a new church management software. We've had a church management software for many, many years, and we've got a lot of information on y'all, so, uh, so, so we, we, we keep track of you. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, we don't have that much information. But what we do, do want to make sure is that as we move to this new software, that we have the very best information that's available. And so that's what this, this form is. Um, I would just ask that every adult uh, member of our church that's here today fill this out. If you're not an adult, don't worry about it. And the reason that if you're, an adult, if you're not an adult is parents in this software, you have some privacy settings that you can control. And so it's not my job to set your privacy settings. It's your job to set your child's privacy settings and so we're gonna let families take care of that once once it's active you'll see you'll be getting some emails in the next few weeks about it uh, so so right now we're just kind of in the early data entry stages uh, so if you would take that and just fill it out give us all the information that you know uh, if there's information that you don't know that's fine um, if you don't know the stuff that's on here uh, we might need to chat a little bit so um, but uh, uh, like your birthday um, we want to know who you, when your birthday is. If you don't know when that is, ask your spouse. Uh, maybe. So uh, if you fill that out, uh, I would love if you just give it to a staff member when you leave today. This is just, uh, we're going to be plugging this into the computer. And then uh, in a couple of weeks, you'll be getting an email, if you have an email address, that, uh, that the system generates that encourages you to, uh, to connect with this new software. It's going to be pretty neat once it's all implemented uh, because currently our church software is in-house. Uh, once this is up and running, it'll be open for other folks to connect with. And so your Sunday school class will be able to connect together with it. Uh, if you're on committees and leadership teams, you're going to be able to connect using this new software. So we're really excited about it. Uh, it's part of the gateway that's allowed us to do the online giving that's now available. Uh, so, so that's what this is about. It's all about data collection today. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the most up-to-date information particularly cell phone numbers, email addresses, and things like that, so that we can do a better job of staying connected and plugged in. So, so I would just uh, commend that to you. It's on Facebook. It's a top post on our Facebook page, so if you'd rather just do it there, you can. But, uh, but we put these on the end of the pews. If you just give it to a staff member when you leave today, that'd be fantastic. Let's go on, join together in prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for time to come together today. God, we're grateful for the opportunity to worship you. Father, we're thankful for our church family for uh, uh, being able to... Uh, uh, to serve together and worship together, Father, we would ask that everything that we do here would bring honor and glory to you, Father. We pray for the lost in our midst today that they might hear uh, that there is a God who saves and that they might respond in faith today. Uh, be with us during this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him, that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Psalm 93, verses 1 through 5 says, The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, he is put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted their voice. The floods have lifted up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness benefits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. Psalm 47, verse 8 says, God reigns over the nation. God sits on his holy throne. We serve a God who sits on a throne in heaven. That is our God. Please stand with us as we sing, God, you reign.
that is called the skull. There they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The work on the cross, the redemptive work on the cross of Calvary gives us salvation and three, freedom through everything that he did. Christ shed his blood to cover all of our sins, our past, present, and future. Now join us, hymn number 492 at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me. published in 1740 he said had I a thousand tongues I would praise him with them all today the choir leads us in a newer song that reminds us that the Lamb of God is worthy of all praise this is oh for a thousand tongues to sing
Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on the earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Jesus is at the center of all things. My question today is, have you made him the center of your life? Please stand as we sing Jesus at the center. Jesus, be the 
Dear Heavenly Father, we, as we've just sang, to keep you at the center, as we take our tithes and our offerings, uh, whether we have financial burden, or we have struggles, or maybe, God, even we're just selfish, uh, may we remember to keep you at the center. So as we give, may we give with a cheerful heart. Uh, may we give faithfully to you. Uh, may we give faithfully to this church. God, may we keep you at the center. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. We 
you are the risen Savior of the world. In this moment of worship, Lord, I pray that each one of us will come to the foot of the cross. You alone are worthy to be praised. We thank you for your love for your grace, for your mercy, for your long-suffering for us. Father, as we continue to worship here, we do pray that as Brian speaks each word will be God-ordained. pray that hearts are touched today. Lord, I pray that someone today will come to know you as their own personal Savior. Because forever you are alive. Forever you reign. You reign on high. And we thank you for all you do for us. All this in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I had originally planned on getting further today in Exodus than I am. Um, Sometimes as a sermon is being put together, the Lord impresses upon your heart that you need to cover something more than more than I had planned, and so uh, so like the bulletin graphic and things like that don't match what I'm saying today because that was printed and and I changed and so uh so I'm I'm allowed to do that I think every once in a while uh but if the bulletin looks the same next week it's because what I put on the bulletin this week will probably be preached next week so um so so just make sure the date is is correct um last week we left Moses standing barefoot in the middle of the midnight wilderness talking to a bush that was on fire I suspect that such a scene uh, in other places might look obscure, but it's a scene that we're very comfortable with, that one that we're very familiar with, as it's a story that's been told time and again uh, in Sunday school classes and vacation Bible schools for generations. 
Of course, uh, most of us know this story without commentary. I mean, even in, a, in the South where we live, uh, these stories are familiar. These aren't necessarily uh, passages that we are unfamiliar with or uncomfortable with. But I do want us to, to slow down and, and, and think about this story, this familiar story, with, with a fresh set of eyes. You see, Moses' life we know has taken a great detour thanks to this rash decision that he had made 40 years earlier to, to murder an abusive Egyptian taskmaster. He was no longer respected as the prince of Egypt. The Hebrews demonstrated that they didn't respect him either. That's what rash decisions do, you know. They have consequences. Of course, many of us have made rash decisions in our life, maybe not as severe, with such a severe consequence as Moses, but rash decisions, nonetheless, are frequent uh, with uh, disastrous consequences. As I have said, if you're somebody with a less than perfect past, then you've got a friend in Moses. You've got good company here. Well, now Moses has been living in this wilderness for 40 years, working as a shepherd, attempting to, to squeak out a living, raising sheep in the desert. He finally in this position, in this place, becomes the deliverer that God wants him to be. On this 40-year detour, he has learned something of empathy and something of uh, humility. On this detour in his life, he has learned the high cost of going his own way, uh, apart from the way the Lord had set aside for him. And here he is at a place called Horeb, in the mountain of, or in the shadow of Mount Sinai, it is here that God calls Moses to his rightful place. If you've got your copy of God's Word, would you open to Exodus chapter 3? This morning I'll be looking in at verses 11 through chapter or two, through verse 22. Please stand with me if you're able in reverence to the reading of God's Word from Exodus chapter 3 beginning in verse 11. Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now please let us go on a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. And so shall you plunder the Egyptians. God, thank you for a story that's familiar in our hearts, God, but one that continues to speak to us today. God, would you bless our time and your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. You know, we recognize here in this story that Moses is not very well motivated to be a deliverer. He is not chomping at the bit to go to work delivering the people of Israel from the king of Egypt. He has some reluctance 
that must be dealt with at first. And I suspect that we're all like that from time to time. When, when God impresses something upon our heart, there's a sense of reluctance. And, and is this is what we're supposed to do? Is this, are these the steps that we should take? Moses here, he doesn't hear God's call and then jump eagerly at the opportunity. He asks two very important questions that we would all do well to answer. He asks two questions that every single human being on the face of the planet will have to answer. The first question Moses asks in verse 11 is very simply, Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I that I should go and deliver these people? Who am I? Now, we know what's going on behind that question. There, there's a lot happening behind the scenes. Moses is, is thinking in the back of his mind. He gave up his leadership diploma a long, long time ago. He buried that diploma in the sand alongside that Egyptian taskmaster. Moses is thinking, I I'm not fit to lead a people. I can barely lead this flock of sheep in the desert. He says, he's thinking, my past is too dark. My pedigree is too mixed up. I don't come from the right family. Moses has to honestly be thinking, I don't even know who my true family really is. How can God ever use somebody like me to do something so big and so, so tremendous as this? God, do you know the things that I've done? God, do you know where I've been? God, do you know how unqualified I am for a job like this? You know, as I went through those questions, I suspect that for many of us, some of those questions sounded familiar because we found ourselves asking those very same questions of our own life. Some of you here today, you know for a fact that God wants to save you. You know that God has been working in your heart, that God has been calling your name, but you have a long list of questions, a long list of excuses, a long list of things that you want answered before you're willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice God's answer. Notice what God says. He didn't look at Moses and say, you know what, Moses, you're right. You're a murderer. Let me find someone else, someone with a cleaner past. God doesn't look at Moses and say, you know, Moses, you're right. You're, you're not qualified to do this. I neglected to look over your resume. And, and Moses, now that you mention it, I think I'll go find someone in Egypt who's more fit, who's more qualified to lead this coming insurrection. God doesn't even validate the concern. What does God say? Very simply, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Very simply. In other words, God looks at Moses. He says, it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you've done it with. You know, that's the beauty of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of you who are in Christ, the Bible says that you are a brand new creation. You can bring up your past, your mistakes, your sins, but in Christ, God has taken those mistakes, God has taken those failures, God has taken those sins, and He has separated them from you as far as the east is from the west. And now he looks at you and he simply says, I am with you. I want to encourage you today, church, that if you're in Christ, he is with you. You may, from time to time, feel like a past full of mistakes is, is played in front of your eyes like a bad movie that you would love to forget. But I want to tell you today that that movie is not produced by God who loves you. That movie is produced by a devil who accuses you. He wants you to be defeated, destroyed, beat down, beat up, ineffective, inefficient. He wants you to be filled with doubts and fully dismayed. But God looks at you as a child of his with absolute certainty. And he says, I am with you. I am with you. And he said it to Moses right here in verse 12. But let's not forget the promise made by the Lord Jesus Christ. The last verse of the Gospel of Matthew. Behold, I am with you always 
until the end of the age. Church, I believe that with all my heart. That Jesus looks at each one of us and he says, Behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. You may feel like your past disqualifies you, but I'm here to tell you that there is a Savior who is with you always until the end of the age. So the question we have to ask, well, who am I? Every one of us, who am I? And the answer is this. Those accusations made against me are absolutely right. I am filled with lust and gluttony and greed and sloth and wrath and envy and pride. And so are you. But there's a God in heaven who loves me and he loves you far too much to let us stay that way. And through the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has taken those sins, those mistakes, and he has paid the price for them so that you are no longer known by your mistakes. You are no longer characterized by your failures. You are known as a God. And he says, I am with you until the end of the age. Instead, if you were in Christ, you were a son or a daughter of the Most High. You are princes and princesses of the King of Kings. You are royalty, church. You are precious to Him. You are loved by Him. You are citizens of His kingdom. You are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You are called. You are chosen. You are a priesthood. You are saved. Who am I? There's your answer. There's your answer. That's who you are. And if that's not who you are today, if that's not who you can say you are, if you know the accusations against you are true and there is nothing you can do about it, I want to offer you a solution. The only thing holding you back is you. God has done everything necessary to save you, to rescue you, to change your identity so that when you ask the question of yourself, who am I? The answer is I'm a child of the King. Everything's done. The way has been paved if you, by faith, will trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. He wants to be with you, just as he was with Moses. Well, that's a pretty satisfactory answer for Moses, wouldn't you agree? Uh, that solves all the doubts, no other issues, whatever you say, Lord, I'm ready. Well, there's a second question that must be answered before Moses could move on. A second question that every human being must ultimately answer as well. And the second question is this. God, I know who I am, but who are you? Now, now pay attention. God has already answered this question for Moses. He said it back in verse 6 of this chapter. So Moses is asking a question that he already has been told the answer to. So if you're a parent, I'm sure that you know children like that who ask you questions that they're already fully aware of the answer, but they like to hear it again for some reason. But you'll notice in the following verses that God answers the question three more times. So four times over the course of this chapter, God has answered Moses' question, Who are you? You know, I'm glad God recognizes that we can be somewhat hard-headed from time to time. He knows it all too well. And there are things that we learn about God when he reveals himself to Moses, when he gives Moses his name. The first thing we understand about God is that God is a God of a covenant. Historically, he links himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is a reminder that God continues to keep his promises. He hasn't forgotten a word that he spoke to Abraham. He hasn't forgotten the promises that he would bring them to a land secured and guaranteed by this covenant. He hasn't forgotten the land of the promise. He hasn't forgotten. So we need to be reminded today that God keeps his promises, every single one of them. The second thing we see is that he is an ever-present reality. God said his name, gave us his personal name, translated to I am. I am. Notice God's name is not I was, meaning that he's not some historical idea that has no contemporary significance. There's a lot in our world today that wishes his name was I was. They don't like what he has to say about things today. They wish that he would keep his, his opinion to himself today. 
We live in a world where it is becoming acceptable to birth a baby and kill it on the table. They would love nothing more than for his name to be I was. Because God speaks to the depravity of this culture and he says, my name is not I was. I still speak to this world today. He is not I was. He is not I will be. Meaning he's some future thing that we'll one day have to deal with, but in the meantime we're left to our own devices. There are some people who say, I'd rather just do my thing right now. I'll deal with God some other time. I'll settle it later. There are people like that. Maybe you're in the room today and you just think, I'll just settle this later. I'm going to do my thing now and I'll settle this later. God's name is not I will be. He is not a future reality that we get to deal with in some far off time. His name is I am. Psalm 46 verse 1 says that God is our refuge and strength. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. He is ever-present. His name is I Am. And the third thing that we see about the Lord, we see about God in this revelation of Himself, we see that God is concerned about His people. We were told that God has heard the groaning of His people. He knows their pain and anguish, and He is not finished with them yet. Beloved, God is concerned about you today. You may think that God doesn't care, but the revelation of Scripture is that God absolutely cares. God hears, God knows, God sees the pain. God rejoices in the triumphs. God grieves with us in the defeats. And the reminder here is that God is not finished with us yet. This week, <clears throat> I was listening to a podcast, and I learned about a statement that was made by a very popular Bible teacher, uh, like a half million followers on Twitter. And this is what he said. And so much of what he said is right. But listen to it. Jesus is not your accuser. He's not your prosecutor. He's not your judge. He's your friend and your rescuer. Get to know him for yourself and let the goodness of God change you from the inside out. It's interesting that such a majority of what was said there is true. You know, God is, uh, Jesus is not our accuser, Satan is our accuser. Uh, Jesus is not our prosecutor, he's our defender. He's the one who will, he will, he will stand on our defense when we go face the judgment. Jesus is our friend, absolutely. He is our rescuer, he delivers us. But that one little statement in the middle, God is not your judge couldn't be more wrong. I don't know what this guy's intentions were, but I do recognize that there is an inherent danger in us getting this second question wrong. God, who are you? There's a danger in us missing this. You see, God made it very clear to Moses. He was not an Egyptian god. He was not a Midianite god. He was not some sort of new idol or new revelation. In God's revelation of himself to Moses, he shows Moses that he is the everlasting God who alone is holy and righteous and just. And because God is unchanging, that character doesn't change even to this day. The strange world in which we live wants to remake God into our image when in reality, we need to be remade in His image. I think Mr. Smith, the preacher I alluded to earlier, I think he's trying to say that Jesus isn't judgmental because that's the great sin of the world today. Being judgmental is the worst thing that a person can be today. Jesus isn't judgmental because here's the thing, Jesus doesn't have to be judgmental because He is the perfect judge. He knows all, he sees all, he recognizes all. He understands the intentions of our heart, the desires of our heart. We can't hide anything from him. He can't be judgmental when he knows everything. Let me say this. In answer to the question, God, who are you? Ladies and gentlemen, if your picture of Jesus is anything less than what the Bible says about him, 
then your picture of Jesus is wholly inadequate. And that's holy with a W, not holy with an H. If your picture of Jesus is anything less than what the Bible says about him, then your picture of Jesus is insufficient. You know, I'd intended to get to Moses' excuses for why he couldn't go be the deliverer. But these two questions needed to be addressed for us today because we find ourselves asking them. We live in a culture that day in and day out is asking these questions. Our news is filled with people who are trying to answer these questions. And men and women, the only way we can answer those questions is to see what God has said about Himself in His Word. And as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we today are the only ones equipped to answer these questions. No one else can answer the question. If you ask the world outside, who are you? Well, generally speaking, the world outside thinks we're okay. We're we're decent folk. You know, there's a few bad apples, but but we're going to work our we're going to work our stuff out. And that's not what the Bible says about us. The Bible says that we are sinful from birth and destined for a place called hell. But there's a God in heaven who is willing to rescue us from that destination if we will by faith trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You ask the world today, who do you think God is? (laughs) Good luck finding an answer. Good luck finding some sort of explanation for who that is today because the fact of the matter is they don't know. But we know because he's told us who he is. His name is I Am. And he is holy, and he is just, and he is righteous, and he is loving, and he is kind, and he is caring. See, the answers that our society will cook up to those questions are always going to leave us wanting. So I ask again, who are you? Who are you? Are you a child of the king? Or maybe you could be Come one today. In just a moment, I'll give you that opportunity. But just come down front here at this, this, this altar to say, Pastor, I'd love nothing more than today to have my identity changed, to, to not be known as the sinner, the, the person without any hope, but that today I can become a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'll tell you today, you can become royalty today right here in Chattanooga Valley. Royalty. Come in as a sinner and walk out as a prince or a princess because everyone who's in Christ is a new creature. Who is God? He's exactly who he says he is and nothing less. Let us guard ourselves against trying to make him into our image. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Got two simple questions asked by Moses. Who am I? And who are you? The answer to those questions is profound. And it's not just life-changing. It's eternity-changing. God, answering those questions correctly can cause a a sinner destined for hell to become a precious child of the King if they will, by faith, trust the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness. God, in these next few moments, I would ask that if there's any here today that can't answer that question correctly, God, that you would work in their heart, compel them, God, to make the decision today that will absolutely rearrange their eternity. And God, I would pray that as we seek an answer to the second question, God, who are you? God, that we would repent from trying to make you in our image. That we would repent from this this buffet idea, this buffet mindset that I'll take the bits and pieces that I like 
and I'll leave the bits and pieces that I don't. I can take, God, that you're holy, that you're, I can take you're a friend. God, I don't want you looking deep into my heart and seeing my sin and my rebellion. I can take you, God, as a provider. But God, I'd rather not have you as a disciplinarian. And so, God, if there is a picture of Christ in our hearts that is anything less than the Christ of the Bible. Oh God, let us repent from that error today and understand you for who you are, all of who you are, not just the parts that we like. God, we live in a lost and a depraved world. (laughs) In a world where God, there's, there's, a, there's a conversation being had about murdering a baby <laughs> on its way to taking its first breath. Oh God, your church today, we have the answers to these questions. God, we have the only source of hope God, in a generation that's hopeless. So God, would you mobilize us and deploy us to move beyond our pews and the four walls of our sanctuaries. That we'd overcome our social media outrage and that we'd start to talk to people and serve people made in your image who you desire to save. God, if there's any lost in our midst, would you compel their hearts to make a decision to follow you? Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation. If you're here today, you're going to give your life to Christ. I'm going to give you that opportunity. You can come today. Take my hand. Take Spencer's hand. We'd love to share with you how you can begin a new life with Christ right here today in this place. If you're here today and, and, and you've had a, a goofy perception of Jesus that's outside the bounds of Scripture, just take time today to repent from that. You don't have to do that here. You can do it at your seat. Maybe you're here and this is the place that you want to call home and make your church. So this is where your church family is going to make You can do that today during this time as well. Let's stand together and sing as the Lord.